The question of whether IHL binds international organizations only arises when it is the organization itself as a subject distinct from its member states which intervenes and not the member states under the authorization of the organization. Needless to say that if it is in fact the member states that intervene, then they are bound by IHL. The question of distinguishing an organization from its members is a recurring theme in academic inquiries on international organizations. However, we are not concerned with overarching principles. Instead, we must take a pragmatic case-by-case -case approach. A crucial question in this respect is whether the organization or the states exercise operational and strategic control over the armed forces involved in the conflict. The United Nations is an international organization having significant capacities to engage in hostilities and which was the first involved in armed conflicts. So it is useful to begin by analyzing it. With respect to the UN, there are three main types of forces that can act in the name of the UN. We have first the national forces authorized by the UN Security Council to take all necessary measures, which means the use of force, to perform a specific mandate. The first clear instance of such a practice was the authorization given to the UN member states to use force in reaction to the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1991. This practice is now well established, with the most recent case being the authorization given to use force in Libya to protect civilians in 2011. The national forces involved in such missions are authorized on the basis of a binding UN Security Council decision adopted under the Charter, Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. They do not therefore need the consent of the state where they are deployed. It is clear that those forces remain under the operational and strategic control of the states. It is not therefore the UN, but its member states which intervene in that case. The second type of forces which operate under UN authorization are peacekeeping forces. These are the main forces currently acting under the UN umbrella. They are different from the authorized national forces in two main respects. First, concerning their mandate. They are nominally neutral forces, which cannot be deployed without the consent of the host states and can only use force to defend themselves. Second, concerning their nature, they operate under the direct authority of the UN. Forces assigned to peacekeeping missions are placed at the disposal of the UN and under the command and operational control of that organization, with the UN Secretary General exercising that control. Formally, they are considered as a UN subsidiary body and their members are treated as UN officials. So when those forces are deployed, it is the UN which intervenes and not the states contributing to those forces. The same is true with respect to the third type of forces acting under the UN umbrella, those called peacemaking forces. So-called peacemaking missions are similar to peacekeepers, but they are employed in conflict with zones with a view to create the conditions to peace, rather than preventing the outbreak of conflict or supervising a peace agreement. One example of a peacemaking force is the one operating in Congo, which is currently one of the biggest military UN forces deployed. Formally, peacemaking missions are also UN forces under the UN operational and strategic control. 
The main difference with the peacekeeping forces is that, like the national authorized forces, they are authorized to use force by abiding UN Security Council decisions, adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. They can therefore be deployed without the consent of the host state and may use force coercively in order to achieve the objectives of the mission. At first glance, therefore, it may seem straightforward to see which scenarios the UN is bound by IHL. However, given the propensity for national authorities to give specific instructions to their contingents of troops, it is necessary to examine each incident individually in order to, in order to ascertain whether or not the organization or the states are exercising command over the troops. In other words, what matters is what happens on the ground. This means we have to examine in detail the chain of commands for each military operation and identifying who has the final words on the conduct of those operations.